both libraries is a little bit different because, as you know, you cannot install an um, Android library uh, on a device. So the artifact is an AAR file and you just cannot install that. So um, what happens is um, Gradle just builds the test APK and it adds your Android library as a dependency to that. So you actually have your um, test code and your application code um, in the same APK. But apart from that, it's, it's very similar. Um, to what you have if you don't have a library. So, if you want to learn more about Gravel, um, Xavier Tukhain, who is our uh, uh, SDK tools lead, um, he wrote a, a great Gravel plugin user guide, and we're going to add more and more um, of these two uh, developers that have read this on as well. So, the next thing I want to talk about is emulators. If I talk about emulators for testing to developers, one thing I often hear is, okay, I cannot use an emulator for testing because they cannot really catch the hard bugs. But what, what does it mean, right? Um, and if you, if you look at, at how, how Google Teams test internally, um, you'll notice that emulator testing is becoming increasingly popular. So if you look, if you look on the chart on the right, um, um, it shows you the actual test runs we had on Google Infrastructure on emulators in uh, in, uh, from 2012 until 2013, and in Q4, we ran over 300 million tests, and you can see the growth of that. So um, we're our engineers are using emulator testing more and more. So this raises the question: Why do we use emulators more and more? Um, and the answer is pretty simple: um, because it allows you to test a wide variety of bugs at a relatively low cost. So, for example, just think about it. you can catch box on for, for certain API levels, or if you think about responsive design, which is something very important if you develop for Android, you can you can test, you don't need a device for that, you can test all your layouts on different emulator configurations, or memory, another common thing, which is generally hard to test in a while, but you can easily have it with emulators. Um, and we did, we did some research on that, and what we found is that the majority of bugs you encounter in your code are relational bugs, not other exceptions. So that's what you know, that, that this accounts to 9% of your bug, and you really should catch those in an automated fashion, because um, even if you are, you are your own tester, or even if you have like a, a test team um, of software engineers in test, um, you really want them to catch the hot bugs, right? You really want them to test things that you cannot automate very easily, so connectivity issues, or, or if, you, if you develop a camera app, man, that, depend, that really depends on, on a specific driver on a device, but these bugs only account for 10%, so you should really take advantage um, of emulators to catch the logical uh, bugs. So, well, I mean, we all know the emulator used to be slow, and everybody is telling the emulator is slow, but um, with API 15 or 6 API 15, we actually ship x86 system images. And 6 API 17, um, we also have um, the Google API image. And um, with these images, um, together with the intro hack sample plugin, you can enable hardware separation. And you can actually run, run on real hardware. Um, and um, you, can, you can actually, uh, on the right, you can see the SDK manager. And you just have to download the images and the plugin there. Um, and after that, you can just uh, go ahead and create a uh, UTFD manager um, to create an x86 emulator. So you just so you just have to select your x86 image, <coughs> and then you probably, if you locally, you want to also enable the uh, GPU support because this makes it even faster. Um, <coughs> uh, on the left of uh, host GPU, you also see snapshots. This is an option you might want to use if you if you run on the build servers or in the cloud because. This allows you to actually write a script which brings up the emulator in a clean state, run your test, and then shut off the emulator. And so also there, there's no time waiting on the emulator, um, and that makes, makes it pretty fast on the build server. If you want to learn more about emulators, I probably should keep those slides up longer because there's no good way to, to specify what URL, the conclusion URL shortener. Um, but I show them at the end again. All right, Espresso. Um, how many people in here do know what Espresso is? Oh wow, that, that's a lot. I'm really impressed. 
And how many people do actually use it in their day-to-day -day development? Okay, that's less, but that's, that's still good. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty excited. Um, in Espresso, I was involved um, in, in Espresso. And so, um, Espresso basically is a new approach to uh, UI testing on Android. Um, it's a thin abstraction layer on top of the instrumentation APIs. Basically, and we launched it um, as a preview publicly in October um, on contactgoogle.com. Um, and since then, we've seen really tremendous growth. So a lot of people are using it already. We have uh, 1,000 active users, we have 3,000 monthly website visitors, and more importantly, we have 300 test sessions and almost 7 million test runs. And that's, that's actually um, pretty good. So, why did we develop Espresso? So, um, I think basically there are two answers to that question. The one is that the API that we have right now is very low level, and it's very hard to actually, or you need to have a lot of knowledge to write a basic unit test. And the other thing is that it's a lot of boilerplate code, so, so that's one problem. The other problem is, if you have like a thousand tests, or many, many tests, um, and reliability and performance definitely becomes a problem if you don't do it right. So these were like the two problems that Espresso um, tries to solve, and it does it with an easy and small and very clean API, um, and um, it really does it with like fast test execution. And but let's have a look at a quick example, just a before and after example. So um, we have a pretty pretty common test use case here. So you have your activity, you have a fragment, you have two views hosted in that fragment. And um, so, so what is that does? You can enter a text, you can click a button, and then activity B opens up and it displays the text, right? So that's a very simple scenario. So let's have a look at a test before Espresso. So the first thing you would do is actually you would find your views, right? So this is more or less sort of code. This is not meant, meant, to, meant to actually run. So after that, you have to create a monitor because you want to monitor the transition between activity A and activity B. The next thing you have to do is something like this. And this is where you have to have a lot of knowledge about the test framework. You have to know, in order to request focus, you have to run on a UI thread. And you have to use uh, this method um, if you don't want, you want your test to fail. So after that, <clears throat> um, you actually uh, have to go wait for I think what this does. It waits until the message queue of the handler is empty before you can actually um, execute your next your next step in the test. So the next step in the test is normally in that case it's okay. You want to enter some text, so you send some string to the test. Again, after that, you have to wait. Sometimes it's not obvious if you, if you have to use the method or not, and that's why, why often you end up using it um, in cases you don't actually need it. So and now, we're ready to click on the button and send the text to the next activity. Okay, so now we expect the next activity to come up. So what we have to do, we have to wait again. We have to say, wait for activity one time out to basically wait for the next activity to come up. If it comes up, we then can find a view, we can, we can make our assertion, which was our, which was our main goal, that the text is displayed, and then we have to unregister our monitor. And so, if you look at this example, that's a lot of global play code, and it, uh, even left out bits that, that you have to do in order to make it 100% reliable. And with Espresso, that's completely different because the only thing Espresso cares about are views. In Espresso, in Espresso, we all know what activity is in fragment. The only thing Espresso cares about is views, and it cares a little bit about windows. But it's more or less like you would test your app. And let's have a look at the same code with Espresso. So <clears throat> the first thing um, we want to do actually is to uh, enter some text in the edit text field. We can do that with that one single line of code. We say match us the, the view with that ID and then perform on view action and type some text in there. That's basically it. That's all you have to do. Then we want to perform a click on the button. So again, we match our view 
we um, uh, execute the perform method and we uh, perform a few actions. Like and the last thing we want to do is we actually want to verify um, the assertion that the text is displayed in the other activity. And we do that by again matching the view and then uh, using the check method to check the assertion. So, and really basically, this is a, this is a, a this is the same test with before and after. But that's three or four lines of code, and the other one was 20 or 30 lines of code. Even more importantly, if you look at that code, there's not much overlay code in it. If you look at it, you, you don't have to deal with activities, right? You don't. You also don't have to deal with asynchronous things that happen. You don't have to deal with synchronization, and that's um, that's really the the beauty of Espresso. So with Espresso, you normally do three things. The one thing is you find a view and you perform a view action on it. You've seen this, but it's pretty easy. The other thing um, you might want to do uh, in your UI tests are work with adapter views. So basically, I mean, most of the screens are backed by adapters, right? So if you have a print view or a list view, we all use adapter in the background. And Espresso actually has a pretty smart way of solving that problem because it allows you to match on a set of data. So, so in that case, we, our adapter is backed up by a list of strings, and we can just say, find me that specific item in the list of strings. Um, <clears throat> find me that adapter with that specific item, and then click on it at position four. That's all you have to do. And with instrumentation, this gets, um, you have a lot of problems, but I think it's a lot messier. And the other thing um, you want to do with Espresso is um, check some assertion. Um, and for this, uh, we have two assertions, and it works uh, pretty much in the same way uh, <clears throat> like matching the human performing the view action. So if you look at the API from, from a world's eye view, basically all we have is two, the two main entry methods on view and on data. And then we can use one of the view measures to find the view we want to operate on. And this returns us a view interaction or a data interaction. On these interactions, we can either perform a view action or we can check an assertion. And that's, basic, that's, that's basically all you need to know about the API. Um, as you see in the example before, there's some more magic involved. And this magic mostly comes from Matures. So, Espresso um, uh, actually uses hand, reuses hand pressed matches, which is maybe the most popular uh, matching library uh, for human testing um, in, in Java, and a lot of people on Android um, use it as well. So, Espresso extends that API, and what that means is that it's very powerful because you can extend the API very easily as well, but you can also reuse all the existing matches that are already out there. And um, we also provide you with a set of view measures um, in the in view measures class, which are kind of existing. So, view measure is one part of magic. The other part are actions. So, um, view actions are actions you can perform on a view. And the good thing is, we guarantee that these actions are run on a UI thread for you, so you don't have to deal with, with any of, of, the, of the first example. We run those actions on your thread. You don't have to care about it. Um, and again, we have, we have a few actions class where we already provide you with common metrics like click, scroll to, um, and write text. And you also can write your own custom metrics. I have an example, actually, for the layer which shows how easy it is. So, yeah, that, that basically was, was, was the first part. Um, that was the API part, writing a small and simple API, which is fun to use. The other thing I mentioned was um, getting tests more reliable and less flaky. And um, something we do on Espresso, um, which makes this possible, is we synchronize everything. So if you, if you have a UI event, what we do is we wait until the app is idle, then we execute the operation, and then uh, we wait until it completes before we move on in the test. And by doing that, we, we actually um, prevent side effects and we prevent unreliable tests. So we do the same thing 
for background resources as well. So everything that runs in a background thread on a background worker uh, and is not synchronized can really lead to unreliable and flipping tests. So um, what we do is, um, if you use an async task, we already do that for you. You, you don't actually have to do anything for that. Um, but for example, I know you might use your own sort of way to do asynchronous uh, workers. So you might use an intent service, you might use your own thread pool, or you, you might use a handle thread. So what you can do is, if you have any of these implementations, you can just tell Espresso when you're idle. And there's an interface for that called idle resource. And you can just implement that every time your thread pool goes idle. You can just tell Espresso, okay, all my work is done. <clears throat> that will happen. And this is how we hope we can guarantee a much more reliable and also faster test execution um, with Espresso. And recently, um, we released Espresso 1.1. And there are some interesting things in there which also show how, how extensible our API is. So basically, um, uh, the mo most of you probably know there is this pattern called uh, navigation drawer. It's the drawer where you invest in swipe and it's like the main navigation element um, in Android app these days. And so there, there was a smart Google engineer and he said, oh look, I have this navigation drawer and I want to test it. So what he did is it took him one, it took him only a few hours on, on a day. And what he did is he just wrote two measures um, which allowed him to um, actually check if the drawer is open or if it's closed. And the other thing he did is he wrote a few actions to basically allow you to bring the drawer open and close the drawer. And, and this really shows the power um, of extensibility in the Espresso API. Another thing, it was also added by Google engineers in, in just a few hours, we now have swipe support. So we just have custom actions for swipe, swipe left and swipe right. So um, normally you, you would have a, a view page where you have a host of fragments and you just want to swipe through them. Now we can just do it with like one button. And the other thing we recently added, that's maybe the most important thing is, we now allow you to switch between windows because one problem in tests, um, in implementation tests always was that you only could, uh, could do, make assertions of right tests for views in the interaction window. You know, for example, if you have an auto search box, you, you would, it was not possible to actually change the window and then click something in the other window. And with us, with us one by one, yeah, So, if you want to learn more about um, Espresso, you can go to that link. Um, it's a preview right now. Um, we're working really hard on, on getting Espresso in layers P uh, very soon. So, there are basically there, there are two reasons to it. Um, one reason is that we want to be able to build Espresso with Rel, and we want to make it very easy to use Espresso. Basically, just a one liner in your, in your build that Rel file. Um, Started, um, you can you can just uh, uh, go to the Android testing website um, and use it today until we have done the work for you and ported it to the uh, ISP. So the next thing I want to talk about um, is pretty exciting stuff actually because this is something that I've been involved in that we've been working on over the past year and um, unfortunately we're we're now ready to ship it. But um, we're going to release something called the Android Testing Support Library um, this year. Um, basically, what it is, it's an unbundled steady testing library. And why, why are we doing this? Um, there's one simple reason right now. The testing framework is bundled um, with the platform. So if, if, the, if there are bugs or if you want to add new APIs, we have to wait for the platform release. And this makes it not easy to to uh, and have faster release cycles, um, and that's that's uh, the main reason why we do it. And it's actually already in ARSP, so if you go to that link, you can see a early version um, of it already, um, and you can start playing around with it. 
Um, some of the features um, in Android to put te Android test and phone library will be, I think the first bullet point is something you guys have been waiting on for a long time. We're going to introduce JPM4 uh, finally, and even more importantly, we're going to use upstream dependencies for that. Because right now, if, if you look at the um, <clears throat> uh, at the Java docs, you will see that we use a slightly modified version of JQ, and we don't want to do that going forward. We want to use upstream dependencies. Um, the other thing we're going to introduce are annotations. So if you now can, if you, if you if you want to get a reference to the instrumentation, you just can can use an annotation for that. Or if you want to get a hold of the topic context, you can use an annotation for that. Um, and even the bundle um, which was used to start uh, the instrumentation, you can get your hands on that. And the third thing we're going to work on is a more simplified runner API. Because right now, if you think about it, if, if you use, I mean, there are a bunch of uh, testing frameworks out there, everybody uses its own test runner, and it's, it's really, really hard to, to actually um, keep all those tests in the same folder or in the same package and run all these tests. You can do it, but it's a lot of effort. And we should be better than that, and that's why we are looking at this as well. So, how will a test look like with uh, Android testing support library? Um, basically, uh, yeah, I, I, I just talked about it. You can use those annotations to inject instrumentation context, but you now can also use add before and add test and add after and everything you want to use in your test. It's actually still backwards compatible, so you don't have to write, don't have to rewrite all your tests. You can still use um, JPM3, but you can also use JPM4. And that's um, a pretty cool thing. And I, we're, we're really trying to, to get this out uh, this year, and maybe that's been working out. Um, the other thing I want to talk about, which is also something um, which we've never talked about before, is, um, and which we're also going to raise pretty soon, is uh, instrumentation mode for your automator. I think that's that's very important for, for a few people, or maybe for many people in the room. Because the problem with your automator was um, <clears throat> that you could not access instrumentation and you didn't have any, any way to actually access the context of uh, any instrumentation you guys. So, unbubbled uh, uh, instrumentation mode, your automator actually <clears throat> uh, still allows you to do cross process testing. It uses an API called UI Automation, which is also an API of instrumentation. I know it's confusing, but it's, it's, it's using that to enable cross-process capabilities and you, you can test cross-apps, basically, with that. And the other thing is, um, because it's using instrumentation and has its own test runner, you don't have to use a custom iTask anymore to compile your code, then, then deploy the app on your device, then use a specific AP command to do that. It's all going away. It's basically just an instrumentation test runner, and you also can reuse all your tests. And I think that's actually pretty exciting because I often don't feel like that a lot of people want to do things like just bring up an activity but use your automator to actually test it, um, and then and then just finish the activity. Um, and now um, with this, we will be able to do it. <clears throat> Um, the last thing uh, I want to talk about is Intento, and that's like, that's really my baby because I, I really love it. Um, <coughs> Intento is like Mokido, but for Intent. So, for those who don't know about Mokido, it's, it's maybe the most popular marketing framework in the Android world, um, and maybe also uh, in the Java world. And what it does is, it allows you, if you write a unit task, it allows you to concentrate on the unitary task, it allows you to basically provide test doubles and stop at the boundary. So you don't, because you, if you write a test for one component, you don't want to test all your dependencies as well. They should be tested in a single unit. And if you think about Android, this even becomes worse. <clears throat> because if you want to test a component in Android in, in isolation, um, that's not easy to do, right? Because uh, let's look at a, a quick example. So you, you have your process, um, you have your package name, and you write this app where users can pick a contact um, using the, the native Android contact picker. So um, as soon as you click on pick contact, what will happen is you will create an intent, you will set up the intent to instrumentation, instrumentation will forward um, this intent and start up the other process. 
But the problem is, as soon as you leave that process, you, you can't click on the thing because it runs in a different process. And so basically, you don't know what's going on, right? And um, the only way to overcome this right now is UI elevator. But you probably don't, don't want to use that if you just want to test like that one single uh, activity, right? Um, and so that's probably not really what you want because another thing, another thing there is um, you don't want to test other components in the system. You don't want to test other packages at all. And let's say you have like 50 tests depending on that contract on the other unit and they change something in the contract. Um, the consequence is all your tests will fail, but they will not fail because the logic in your code is wrong. They will fail, they will fail because they changed the contract. And these are bugs you can catch, for example, with manual testing, but you don't want to test it to fail because another component fails or to add it fails. So, Intentional allows you to do hermetic inter application testing. Um, it uses a custom instrumentation for that. And basically what it does, it records all the outgoing intents and then it enables two scenarios. One scenario is you just want to verify, for example, if you have a button which you can click that and the native data opens, you want to verify that the thing was sent. That's one scenario. The other scenario, what you want to do which is more powerful, uh, is you want to actually stop the result that's returned, that's important in the contact paper example. So, and basically it was designed to work with Espresso, but it uses the normal instrumentation, and so you can use it in an instrumentation test. And it's also very easy to use. Um, you just call intento.init to initialize it, and you call intento release to release it. And then you just can do easy intent validation. So um, again, we have this example where you want to uh, bring up the external on the phone, uh, attempting the test, but you probably don't want to do that in your UI test, right? So what we do, we click on our button, and then we say intended, there was an intent to the, to the name phone dialer, <coughs> or that's, um, I'm sorry, that's actually the assertion. You say, I intended that there was an intent sent to the phone dialer, right? And that's all you have to do, that's your check, that's, that, that's, your, uh, that's your assertion right there. And that's pretty cool. Um, the other thing you can do is you can stop intents. So um, this is a more complex example um, uh, for the contact picker um, uh, scenario I just mentioned. So what we do here, we just the first thing we do is we create our own result intent, and then we create an activity result and add that intent. And then we say, okay, intento, if you get an intent targeted um, at the contact and the contacts package, respond with our result. So that's the setup. And then we actually perform a click on our contact picker button. And the next thing we can do is we can then just check the insertion. Because what happens is Intento intercepts the event, returns the result, and your own activity result method is called. And um, I really love using it, it's, it's pretty cool. And the good thing is Intento also uses hand press measures. Um, and you can use those to match your intents. And we also have some common intent measures for Android. You can match any intent, or you can match on action, on extras, you can bind all of those. Um, and it's, it's very powerful. Um, yeah, um, but the APIs are, I mean, this is work in progress. They, they might change, but we, we also hope to release this uh, sometime soon. So yeah, that's basically it for my talk. Um, I, I leave this up here for another second if you want to um, take a photo and uh, go to one of those things. And yeah, just.
and not, not precise. 